This is Jim McKeith, and welcome to this webinar on working with OpenAI's GPT-3. Uh, this is going to be a kind of a combination of some live content and some pre-recorded content for various reasons. I'll explain as we go along. And uh, I am hoping there's a lot of interest in this, and this will be the first of many uh, on the topic. We did a tea, coffee, and code on artificial intelligence in general last week. And uh, hopefully that was if you hopefully you're able to attend that and you got some uh, some ideas or some get some general information about this. But we will go more specifically into OpenAI's GPT-3. I just put a link in the chat for the blog post that goes along with this. That blog post has the um, slides and we'll eventually have the replay to go with this. Uh, clearly, the replay can't be on there yet because. It hasn't been made. Ah, Patrick just finished up four hours on Twitch and made it to join us. Perfect. Glad you could make it. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into this and get started. The agenda, uh, plan on talking about open AI or AI, artificial intelligence in general and software development, and then go into specifics of open AI and uh, GPT, uh, the generative pre-trained transformer, show how to work with it the how the rest apis work and some uh uh delphi examples and i was originally going to do some c plus plus examples too but i didn't feel like anything i was doing involved that much delphi code it's mostly involving the rest components which will behave the same uh, on both Delphi and C++ builder so i did not generate uh, c++ specific demos but uh, if you're familiar with the REST components, you will totally be able to uh, accomplish this with uh, with C++ as well. Now, if you were on the Tea, Coffee, and Code last week where we talked about um, artificial intelligence, you may remember this story, but I did want to share it again because it is especially relevant. Back in 1980, my parents got me a Commodore VIC-20, which... Uh, if you know, well, I guess I told you the year. That uh, gives you an idea about how old I was, or about how old I am now. The When I got this and started programming on it, I knew I was going to be a programmer, a software developer. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that career path looked like or anything, but I knew that I was going to be programming computers the rest of my life. And uh, you know, if, when it wasn't the main part of my job, it was my hobby to various deg varying degrees. But um, one thing that was really interesting that happened to me in 1980 is there was two things that people warned me about when I said I was going to be a computer programmer. One was they said, oh, you'll get carpal tunnel because carpal tunnel was all the rage in 1980. And two, they said, don't, you don't want to do that because in not much time at all, computers will be programming themselves and all the programmers will be out of a job. And I thought that was a really, so first of all, carpal tunnel, I was like, oh, why are they trying to scare me off from this career? This seemed like a really good career. I was confused about that. But then the the one about computers eventually programming themselves and programmers getting out of business struck me as kind of odd because i was thinking if computers could program themselves then they could do anything and i think everybody would be out of a big job at that point was kind of my thought and i was like well but somebody has to tell the computers how to program themselves you know i i it just seemed like a really weird scare tactic that people were resorting to uh interestingly though i did uh, a year ago, find out I had carpal tunnel in my right hand. So it turns out carpal tunnel is not just the boogeyman, although the current understanding of science, the medicine behind it, is that carpal tunnel is not a um, result of using computers or poor um, hand positioning and stuff, but is uh, mostly genetic. Some other things being overweight can contribute to it as well. But using a repetitive motions or poor hand positioning can aggravate it. So I ended up having surgery on my right hand to uh, fix that, and it's doing much better now. The left hand is, is just fine. But what about computers? Are they programming themselves yet? So I, I saw this uh, comic from Commit Strip that I think perfectly explains the conversation I had back in uh, 1980. Uh, um, Oh, actually, I forgot. Sorry. 
the reason I on the right I have night or 2017 and the picture of Tokyo Tower is that in 2017, which was now four years ago, I can't believe it, I was in Tokyo for the launch of Delphi Tokyo. And there was a press event and I was speaking to members of the press and one of the members of the press afterwards asked me the question, why would you be out promoting this new development tool? Because aren't computers going to start programming themselves and put developers all out of business? And I was just like, wow, that's the exact same question someone posed to me back in 1980. And I shared with him that story that that was the exact same thing I heard in 1980 and it still hasn't happened. Still, computers still aren't programming themselves. So it, in response to that, like I said, somebody has to tell the computers how to program themselves. And if you look at where we've come from with machine code and uh, programming the Altair by flipping the little switches on the front of it or using punch cards, I mean, computers are per pretty much programming themselves anymore. You know, we're, we're providing this very high level um, description, specification of what, it, what we want it to do. And it creates all this code for us, especially with Delphi and C++ Builder, you're able to use components and you're able to work at this very, high, very, very high level, uh, almost to a low code degree and define your application and define so much of your functionality with doing very little writing of code. Uh, very, very rarely do we have to result, resort to machine code or even assembly language anymore. So in the future, IDEs will continue to get smarter and they'll continue to make our jobs easier but we're also the what the requirements of what we need to do are continuing to expand so anymore we really need to have a better understanding of user experience and user interface design design in general than we used to have to i mean way back in the day when it was all um terminal applications there wasn't even colors to worry about now i have to make sure i pick colors that look appropriate together. Luckily, Delphi and C++ Builder have styles, but I digress. So OpenAI, it's an artificial intelligence research laboratory that was started by Elon Musk and Sam Altman. Sam Altman is a uh, founder of Y Combinator uh, a Startup Incubator, and they contributed together with some other original investors a billion dollars. Recently, when OpenAI 3 or GPT-3 came out, Microsoft came and said, hey, here's another billion dollars. We want in on this. You guys are tearing it up. And I'll get into more details on what, what was involved in that shortly. Uh, share at the headquarters with Neuralink. If you're not following, Neuralink is incredibly fantastic. And if there is interest in that, put a comment in the question panel that if you want to have a webinar on Neuralink, and I would be thrilled to talk about Neuralink. It's some really cool stuff going on there. Uh, OpenAI is a combination of a open source or a uh, nonprofit as well as a for-profit company. The GPT-3 is the third iterate, their third version of GPT generative. Um, uh, uh, anyway, the but it is their first commercial product. So it is currently in beta. You can sign up for the beta to get beta access. There's a waiting list. You get uh, some free credits to start with, but it is a paid model to use. So what is GPT-3? It is the Generative Pre-Trained Transformer 3. It's a, a language model trained on pretty much all of the internet, <laughs> all of the web, uh, all of Wikipedia. They went through and grabbed tons and tons and tons and tons of data, and they ran I don't, it's so many, I can't, I don't remember. You can look up on the site, the number of hours of computing time that they ran this through to understand and to build this model around natural language that uh, it's like uh, petaflops or teraflops of computing hours. No, tera hours. I, I don't remember. It, it's, it's an astronomical amount of processing that was done on it. And the size of the model is huge. So, because of that, because of the size of the model, it cannot be, it's not something you can download yourself and use. So there are a lot of other things, a lot of other uh, artificial intelligence libraries and machine learning models that you can download and use yourself, you know, get a few GPUs and do some massive parallel stuff and take advantage of it. GPT-3 is not one of those. GPT-3 is 
exists solely hosted by OpenAI. So think of it as infrastructure, if you will. Uh, in theory, there should be a GPT-4 in the near future as well. Like I said, this is the iteration three. So to give you an idea of the scale, GPT-3 has 175 billion machine learning parameters. Now, machine learning parameters are configuration variable variables learned from the training data. It's a, a rough measure of the uh, size, if you will, of the model. The previous largest model was Microsoft's Turing NLG, um, natural language, I forget what the G stands for. It was introduced in February of 2020. It had 17 billion machine learning parameters. GPT-3 introduced in May, so not much longer after <laughs> LG, uh, totally order of magnitude larger. Prior to Microsoft's Turing in LG, GPT-2 had 1.5 billion parameters. So you see we're going order up by orders of magnitude here from November to, or November 2019 to, uh, February 2019 to May 2020, or sorry, 2020, 2020, you can read. So we're, it's 2021 now, so we're due for, I guess, GPT-4 in the near future, uh, possibly. Although, because GPT-3 is the first commercial product, while GPT-4 will come out, chances are it will be integrated into the OpenAI's API. And so the way you use it will probably stay the same, but the power behind it will continue to grow behind the API itself. Hopefully that makes sense. So the API provides a general purpose text in, text out interface. So it could function like a chat bot, if you will, that you type text in, you send a text and it comes back. Uh, you, the way you program it though, is you use a prompt with examples. And I'll show you some examples of what that looks like. But uh, you can think of um, like when you were in school, right? And you had to write a paper and you started by writing the paper by writing that first sentence, right? What is the, um, uh, wow, what's the thesis statement of your paper, and then you write the paper from that thesis statement. So you can think of the prompt as that thesis statement that you would use to write your paper. So you give GPT-3, the, the API, the thesis statement, and it then writes the paper from that. You So you, you use both the prompt and then you provide examples for that. The documentation, a lot of the examples have more than, a few, have a, maybe five examples. Uh, five examples of output that you're looking for. The documentation says roughly you probably want to do about three. The reason for that, the reason you don't want to have too many examples is that you your API usage is measured through tokens. Or uh, I'll, I'll get actually I have another slide to talk about that later. There are a lot of rules about uh, usage, safety, and ethics and showing the interface live. And so everything I've done that is involving actually using the API is pre-recorded for that reason, because I'm not allowed to show it live. Uh, I, the reason for that is that there occasionally will flag things and say, hey, this may be um, dangerous or this may be sensitive or something along those lines and uh, say, don't share this live if it is. I, I've not had it produce anything that was objectionable or sensitive. It usually, every time it's flagged something as such, it was a false positive. But if it was to flag something wrong or was to have produce something that was sensitive, uh, I'm not allowed to show that publicly. So there is quite a bit, so I'm gonna go to examples now. And in explaining this, there's a lot of art to building these prompts and such and refinement. And so some of these, <laughs> it's interesting how often it works and then you tweak something and all of a sudden it just quits working. And I, I really, despite spending some time on this, I really don't understand completely. I'm getting a better understanding of the way this works and some of the pitfalls, which I will point out as we go along. But there is, a, a, it is not a matter of just 
you know, like you interact with your Amazon Echo or Google Home and just give it some sort of vague statement and it magically knows how to work. If you've used one of those, despite the marketing, you know that oftentimes, even though the, the instructions say, speak to it as you would in normally, you still have to learn how to talk to it in the way that gets things done. So that, that's really the way it is working with GPT-3's API or OpenAI's G API. So here's an example of clarification of companies into categories. So the prompt is the following is a list of companies and the categories they fall into. And then it's a, a few examples here. So here's some examples, company, colon, and then categories. So then I went and added to the bottom Embarcadero so, and it came back and told me software technology. And I said, Idera, I said, big data and technology. I said, Microsoft, technology, enterprise cloud, Google, technology, internet search. Okay, it probably should have said advertising in there. That's really Google's main um, uh, source of income. Although I guess maybe that's what social media means. I don't know. Anyway, interesting that it produces that. Now there's some settings, which I'll get into more details later on what these settings are that control the way it behaves. This is based on one of the official examples available in the documentation. So then here's another one, this is a list generator. So uh, it, it said the prompt was a list of characteristics of the Delphi programming language. I provided the first five and then it provided these next ones here. So it looks like good um, I don't, application lifecycle management. I don't necessarily, that applies to Delphi in general. I mean, it, it it does, but I wouldn't think of Delphi as an application lifecycle management tool. It contains stuff functionality around that. Uh, code reuse, I think, is a fantastic one, and rapid prototyping, rapid application development. These three, or code, you know, I don't know, code generation, maybe. I don't know, I can think about it, but it's definitely interesting. There's been a number of the examples you can see online, people are using this to, um, as brainstorming, tools or to help come up with ideas, bust through writer's block, etc. Here's a sentiment classifier. This is based on the Twitter sentiment classifier that they have in the demos. And what I do is I give it a, so the prompt is this is a sentiment classifier and then provided it with some examples. So the examples were formatted like this statement and then it had some statement sentiment and then negative or positive or neutral on each of the examples. I'm not showing you all the examples here, but then I went and gave it some um, statements. So I would type statement colon frowny emoji. I said, okay, that's a negative. And um, I thought this was interesting. I said, I'm home from work. And it said, that's a negative thing, which I'm like, oh, I, I usually think of that as a positive, but okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Miguel says, application lifecycle management was the top business area of Borland at the time uh, they disengaged from Delphi C++ Builder. Yeah, exactly. I had that same thought, actually. The um, that, that that was what was going, that may be where that came from, but it wasn't. So, I mean, that's a Borland thing, <laughs> but it was Borland had separate products that did that, whereas uh, that wasn't part of Delphi. So it's possible that, that it got confused and thought that because Delphi came from Borland, it also had that uh, characteristic. So, yeah. The one thing, this note, so if you read into, I didn't get into uh, a lot of the details on it. If you go to the website and read the documentation, it talks about the training data that GPT-3 is built on is actually frozen at a certain date and time. Uh, I want to say it's 1999 something. So it doesn't know anything newer than 99. So anything prior to 1999, it would know about. So you could ask it about news or movies or current events, and it would know about, uh, you know, the things prior to 1999, but nothing newer than that. Now, OpenAI's API currently uses GPT-3. In later this year or next year, if GPT when GPT four comes out, like I said, it'll become part of the API and we'll, we'll have newer data in it. So uh, that will be where we could use it to access uh, more newer information as well. Terry says home from work might be confused with working from home. That could be. 
um, so I, I thought about that, Terry, that working from home. So like I said, it's, it's 1999, I think it is, and earlier, which is pre-COVID. So pre-working from home being being stuck at home. So I don't know. I, I, it's interesting. It doesn't always give you a the right answer, if you will. I did type the emojis as input. Um, I Well, I didn't type the emojis. I pasted the emojis in because I don't have all the code points memorized. <laughs> uh, Jim suggested the computer might not consider being home as a productive task there for the negative. Oh, yeah. There, you can, I've done some experiments with, uh, some experiments with ch uh, chat bots and there are some other examples online. I do have, if you go to the blog post, which I put in the chat window, I'll put that in here again, if you uh, want to go out there and check it. Actually, I'll put it at the end. The, uh, I have a curated list of videos on YouTube and one of the videos in the YouTube playlist, which I'll, if I have time to, I'll go through and talk about each one later, is a conversation with OpenAI's API, with GPT-3 about being an AI and what that means. And it's really interesting because it is, it's it's hard to explain if you haven't seen it. The, basically, the, the interesting thing that's happening is AI is moving really fast now and all the tests we've defined previously to just say, oh, AI, when it, like the Turing test, right? When you can have a conversation with an AI and not know you're talking to an AI versus a human. Some people would argue that the text-to-speech and uh, speech recognition technology, like in Siri or Google Home, is that already. Other people say, oh, well, not really. And so what, what happens is that as this new technology comes out and expands, we frequently find ourselves moving the goalposts of, oh, well, that's not AI yet. That's not AI yet. That's not AI yet. GPT-3 is, um, <laughs> it really pushes the envelope of all the previous things we thought of as being things that are, you know, general purpose, uh, general AI, uh, things that we, you know, are big, big uh, goals, right? The, the big final goals. Uh, it's definitely AI, but not uh, artificial general intelligence for sure. That's true. It's not, but it is, it is really pushing us to better define what is artificial general intelligence. Uh, there's a question here, Carlos, can GPT-3 used for sales negotiation or product pitching? Actually, it is. If you go to the, actually, I'll just go ahead and open this up here now. Um, oops, I hit the wrong button. Sorry. If you go to GPT, or open AI's documentation, AI, open AI doc, Sorry, I'm having trouble typing. Um, I don't want the Jim, I want the GPT-3. Jim is one of their previous products. Um, okay. Well, it wasn't a commercial product, it was just... Uh... Okay, so if we come in here to the examples... <clears throat> oh, actually, I'll go out here to the examples. So they have... Uh, here's the documentation you can go through. Got some good information in here. Excuse me. So here's the idea where I got the uh, working with emojis. So here it's taking movie titles and turning them into emojis. Right now it's only an empty desktop. Okay, thank you. I forgot that I had... Okay, so I went out here to, uh, here's OpenAI's um, documentation, and here is their examples, example directory, which they recently expanded. Originally, they only had a very, very few examples here, uh, and still, I would like to see more examples here, personally, but there are a lot of other people out there that are talking about things they've done and showing the results, but there's not a lot showing the way they got there. The uh, 
which is interesting because the playground, which is what you can use to experiment with it, does have a way to export your example to share it. So maybe they're changing the, the requirements on that. Okay, so here's the movie to emoji. This takes a movie title, Back to the Future or Batman, Transformers, and displays it in emoji. So again, you would give it a list of uh, examples. So here you have, a, I, it, in this case, the examples are the prompt, and then you give it Spider-Man, and Spider-Man would then give you a spider. And if you give it Incredible Hulk, it would give you example of strong. Uh, so there's an example there, but then there was another one about, was it marketing? There's product ideas. Yeah, add from product description, product name generator. So here's an example, turns a product description into ad copy, write a creative ad for the following product to run on Facebook, and then Okay, so then here's the product description. Airy is a line of skincare products for young women with delicate skin. The ingredients are all natural. So that's the description. And then the prompt for what you want it to give you back. It says, this is the ad I wrote for Facebook aimed at teenage girls. So this is the ad that OpenAI wrote, uh, the API wrote. Do you have sensitive skin? If so, then Airy is for you. Airy products are made with natural ingredients to help you feel good about your skin. Try out Airy for a healthy, Happy, healthy you. So this is, uh, yeah, d helping pitch product ideas and helping with marketing copy. <laughs> uh, here's a product name generator. So you get product description, some seed words, and then it comes up with product names. So this is the prompt that you provide. So you have, usually, this is the most common scenario I've seen, is that you have a, a description of what it is you're having it do, and then some examples, and then here is the prompt for what you want it to give you the results back. So I'm saying, here's my input, and I want you to produce output like I showed you an example of here that matches this description, All right? So that's how you program OpenAI along with setting these settings over here. And, okay. Oh, if you, I think I explained this in one of the demos, but if you want to use this code in Delphi, come here and select curl, and then you copy this right here, and this is what you send into the REST debugger. Okay, so there's a question come in here. Hello, for, hello Turkey, hello everybody for this joining here, if you joined late as well, uh, glad you could make it. So Christopher's asking, to combat fake product reviews, untrue news articles, anti-vaxxers, et cetera, could GPT-3 use to check an overall opinion on said naughtiness, perhaps by checking there are more people informed about the earth is round and not flat? Yes, you could use it for that to, uh, yeah, yeah I, would, I would think you could do to uh, like check for uh, sources to back things up, truth of things. Again, it would have to be prior to the, uh, let me go over here. I think it was in here. Um, so here's safety best practices. These are things you definitely want to be aware of when you're using this. Um, I don't see where it talks about the date. I remember reading it in here, but I don't see it now. But you, you, you could do that for things that had evidence prior to the training date of the model, right? So if it was a current event that happened recently, it would not be able to uh, come up with an answer for you. So summarize, summarizing text, translating English to French or other languages, classifications, keyword extractions. So uh, keyword extraction, you can say, extract keywords for block of text. So here's the block of text and it comes back there's the keywords that pulled out of it. Uh, spreadsheet generator, it, it understands um, text-based graphic formats like um, SVG, scalable vector graphics. And so you can actually have it draw, I didn't have very good success with it, but you can have it draw scalable vector graphics. Uh, I think there's one here on SQL that shows how to write, you can write SQL statements for you. SQL request. So you you tell it what you want, and then you start the SQL statement, and then it generates. This is the uh, SQL query. It, clearly, 
it doesn't know that we have a table called users and that table has columns of state and credits, but it can infer that the table might be called users and that California, it knows California uses a state and that credits must mean something, right? And so if we named our columns based on what we're describing to it, it's able to generate SQL statements for us. One thing I will point out though, is that the, uh, there's a really interesting thing about machine learning generating fake articles, right? So that's a concern. And there is, GPT-3 does have rules that you're not allowed to use it to generate um, articles uh, unless you specifically say, I used it to generate this article as an example of what it can do, but you cannot use it to generate an article that is being published as uh, and not edited by you and presented as being original content. But the interesting thing about that is that there are things that are being designed to detect whether things are generated by AIs, like the deep fakes and stuff. But because of what's called uh, adversarial um, training method, the better we get at detecting fakes, the better it gets at generating fakes. <laughs> uh, All right, so let me go back to the slides. I think, yeah, so the, here's, we're gonna go through some of the settings now. This is the engine, so there's different engine choices. Now, in the API, it doesn't, um, so Carlos is asking how fast is it to get answers from GPT-3? Can it be used in real-time speech recognition, speech synthesis apps? It is, so there's different engines and the different engines are faster. The Ada engine is the fastest. The DaVinci engine is the most robust. Now, um, you could use it. So it doesn't do speech recognition specifically, but if you had a speech recognition front end that could take your speech and feed it into GPT-3, if you were using, um, I don't think DaVinci is fast enough for that. It, you would be at, a noticeable delay, a couple seconds. But uh, if you're using one of the other engines that were faster, that would definitely be fast enough for a, uh, a, a interactive scenario, like when your user's talking to it. Faster engines like ADA. So I was going to point out that the engine, it, nowhere in the API does it talk about GPT-3. And like I said, I think that's because when GPT-4 comes out, like I expect it to this year, then it will just become part of the API. And so maybe they'll add a new engine called uh, uh, Raphael. I don't know. <laughs> that is uh, the, the, the next engine that is it takes advantage of some of the functionality in GPT-4. Uh, and it, we'll probably see these engines continue to evolve as well. Jim points out the circle of AI training, AI fakes is how Skynet is created. True. In the videos I watched for GPT-3, I saw that could definitely pass the Turing test. Yeah, so you can, it, it, can, it can pass the Turing test. And I, one of the sample videos I showed definitely shows that. Now, one of the things that gets interesting is that you can, if you tell it that you want an answer to the questions you give it, and then you give it a question that doesn't have an answer. So for example, if you like, who was the president of the United States in 1643? Well, there was no United States in 1643. If you don't tell it that it can, give you a, I don't know, or a, 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 an answer of, I can't answer this, it will try to answer it for you. And it will give you an answer that is plausible. So it will pick somebody that was 
you know, uh, uh, somehow possibly a leader or related to the United States or, you know, related to the Americas or, you know, maybe they say Christopher Columbus, you know, or something. I don't know. But it would it would try and pick somebody that was plausible to be that. So it makes assumptions from the data if it cannot find the right answer. If you tell it, it has to provide an answer. And so some people point out that that's how it doesn't uh, pass the Turing test is because it can give wrong answers. But a human can also give wrong answers. And if you say, I have, you have to give me an answer, then it will give you an answer. And so if you had the same rules applied to a human, the human had to give you an answer, it would have to give you an answer too, right? So it, yeah, it can pass the Turing test and it can, um, but it, it behaves based on the way you prompt it and the way, you, how you instruct it to answer. Okay, so Carlos is asking, can it uh, mimic the speed or reasoning of a person so I can put it into a customer source model? Yes, absolutely. And that's one of the uh, one of the use cases they talk about is that it could be, so there's the API actually has files, which I'm not gonna get into, where you can upload files to it that it then um, can understand. So for example, we could, uh, upload doc wiki to it right and you could ask it delphi related questions although realistically it already knows doc wiki it's already seen doc wiki because it was trained on the web um so it already understands probably through you know uh uh tokyo or uh 10.3 i don't know anyway it, it understands through some of the recent versions of delphi and could answer questions about delphi which i do have some examples about that later on um Yes, yeah, so, so it, it's information does come from what's on the internet. If bad, wrong information is there, it would it answers be affected. So it it does pull its information from what was on the internet, and but it has. I don't want to say that it can reason or understand, but it kind of sort of can reason and understand, and so it can look and say, "Huh, here is." two different sources of data that provide or two sources of information that provide conflicting information and it generally seems to pull if there's enough information about it it generally seems to pull the correct data sources but not always uh, i'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute so one of the settings you can provide is called max tokens um let me write type a couple answers here Max tokens. Um, can you ask it if humans are good? So there is a, I have a link to a interview with GPT-3 where someone set up a chat bot to talk to GPT-3 and then had an interview with it. And, uh, and that, that, that he gets into a little bit about that, about whether or not it's gonna overthrow humanity and enslave us and stuff like that. Um, Carlos says this thing is approaching Isaac Asimov's multivac. Yes, it is. Uh, I've had some, I've had some attempts to have some philosophical discussions with it. it. The there's a lot of art to getting your prompt set up correctly to for it to behave the way you want it to, and I don't feel like I have it completely figured out for more involved things. But there are, for example, there was a. Uh, there's a lot of, if you do some searches out there, you can find a lot of cool examples of things people have done with it. But there was a website, I can't remember what it's called now, that uses GPT-3 to create a role-playing game experience where you can go in and it will generate a adventure for you in a fantasy world or science fiction world. And you type and it does, it actually, understands what's going on and it generates this world and you interact with this world and stuff it's really kind of interesting so there's a lot a lot of possibility there ai reasoning based on the internet as public opinion could be too biased so there is not a way to set weights towards certain sources or subjects uh christopher um, but you're right. There is definitely some bias out there. There is a webinar, uh, not a webinar, a documentary on YouTube called Coded Bias that I recommend you taking a look at. It doesn't, as far as I know, I haven't gotten through all of it. I don't think it specifically talks about uh, 
GPT-3, but uh, when, when you're using the playground, which is the interface for interacting with GPT-3 for building your applications, building your prompts and stuff, it occasionally will flag things as sensitive and those could be references to it returning uh, incorrect information. My experience has been that's always, not that I've never, I suppose if you were asking it things intentionally to try and get um, things that could be considered offensive or responses that were inappropriate or whatnot, it would probably flag all of those. But uh, every flag it's given me has been a false positive where it's like, oh, this could be sensitive or this could be inappropriate. And I'm like, no, not really. I don't see how that could be that way. So uh, they're working on refining that I'm guessing um, that they have a, I don't think how to describe this. They have, they have a second, like a, a, an adversarial AI that looks at the responses of GPT-3 to determine if it falls into this category of sensitive, offensive. And it's then training that based on user feedback through the playground. So they are refining it, trying to get it to be more truthful, more accurate. But again, because it's so broad, in what you can use it for, it's you always have a uh, possibility of it giving you incorrect information or false information. So it needs when you're developing your application, you need to be aware of that and you need to treat it thusly. So you probably want to have some secondary checks on your application on it to make sure that what it's saying is, uh, you know, not offensive and somehow, if it's possible, verifiable. Christopher said, I'm heavily into GANs. This is very exciting. Cool. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really excited about GANs too. Uh, David said a webinar on Neuralink would be interesting. Okay, I'll, I'll see what I can do about that. Yes, it does flag some responses. Prove it. Them, but so Carlos is asking what about other languages like Spanish? Uh, I so it does have a um, if you come here to the examples, there is an example of French. Uh, English to French translation, where you can say English to French. I would assume it can also do English to Spanish. I have not tried it Spanish to English, but in theory, it probably could. I I don't recall anything in the documentation saying that everything had to be in English, but and it was trained on the web in general. I don't know. It possibly. Let me, I'm going to make a, not translation, but queries. Yeah. So Carlos, I'm going to try, I'm going to try that. I can't do that live. Otherwise I would because of the restrictions on uh, the beta, because it could potentially produce something, uh, a, um, off you know, offensive or sensitive. So I have to do that separately, but I can do that later and produce, and then maybe I can share some information about that. And oh, I got to start moving faster. Um, how soon can we try this thing? So if you want to try this, you have to go to the um, uh, wrong too far. You have to sign up, join the wait list. Okay, so I'll put the link in here in the chat. I signed up when GPT first came out and I just got the accepted a couple months ago. So it takes a while. I think that they're opening it up now because they do have pricing model and stuff. So it's probably getting people on quicker. I don't think I was accepted for any particular reason. I think it was just a matter of they're accepting more and more people all the time. I see a lot of other people that are getting accepted now too that are not related to artificial intelligence. Um, Translating Delphi API without hiring a human translator. It, that's possible. You could use it to translate. So there are other translation specific APIs out there that you could use. I think Marco Cantu did a uh, 
a webinar on using Google Translate API just to you know type text in and have it translate it, but you could use that to translate your user interface as well in real time. Uh, okay, so let me get back to the slides. Here's the pricing information. The pricing information is done on tokens. So when you, one of the parameters you can specify is max tokens, which is the response length, and it defaults to 16. The reason you want to set that is not only to keep it from just generating a lot of results, but also because that's how pricing is based. This is, I think, really fairly reasonable price. It's six cents per thousand tokens. Um, a token is um, pieces of a word. A thousand tokens is about 750 words. I don't know why they didn't do it as words, but the, the paper actually goes into explaining this a little bit better. But um, that this paragraph here is 35 tokens. Okay, and so your token cost in a call includes both your prompt and the response, right? So if you send a very large prompt to it that has a lot of examples and expect a large prompt back, right? Then the, the um, so like a translation, right? For like, hey, translate this paragraph into another language, you would have the, your tokens would include both the input paragraph and the output paragraph. So while you may set, the max response of we'll say a thousand um, and your input your prompt is also a thousand you sent two thousand tokens and that would cost you 12 cents if you're using defentry so not that expensive but uh, it's definitely something you not something you want to just open up in to general to the public patrick just posted a um deep learning delphi client for translation oh cool very cool. Um, temperature is one of the settings. It, <laughs> luckily, when you mouse over it in the uh, playground, it show, explains what these are. But uh, the sampling temperature is the how random it is. So uh, default is one, and zero is a uh, deterministic so basically if you set it to zero it's like there is one answer to this and that's the one answer i want you to give you where if you set it to a higher number then it's more creative and can give you more variations on the answers uh, you can set temperature or top p i have not experimented with setting with both uh, top p is uh does the same thing it, but it does it for a different way i guess uh, alternating sampling Nucleus sampling model consists of the results of the tokens with the top P probability mass. Uh, this is where my lack of high level math and statistics is showing up is not <laughs> great. But um, so with a 0.1 instead of one, it only looks at the top 10% probabilities are considered. So the this is how you can weed out potentially some of the corner cases of data that's out there. And you're saying, I want the data that is most agreed upon, for example. N is the number of responses you want to generate. Uh, by default, it generates one uh, completion for each prompt. So you give it one completion and it gives you back, uh, or you give it your, your prompt and it gives you back one completion. But you can set it to a higher number if you wanna have multiples come back and it can give you some uh, information to help you can choose which one you wanna use or you can look at each of them and provide your own uh, analysis to look at that later. Uh, presence penalty is what you can use to prevent repetition. And same thing with frequency penalty. The text, where the appear the text so far, penalizes new tokens. I, so this one reduces the likelihood of repeating the same line verbatim, whereas this one is its ability to meander onto new topics. Uh, best of is you can use so that it actually generates multiple responses and then um, picks the one that's the best. Oh, I uh, see. Tan said that they uh, applied six months ago to GPT-3 beta and were accepted today. Fantastic. Well, you come to the right place to learn how to use it because I'm going to show you here in just a minute how to use it from Delphi. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe it was almost top of the hour. Um, Okay, and then stop. Uh, so this references that you need 
set your max tokens and stop. Stop is what would be the result when GPT-3 goes to generate this result, stop generating results. So this is how you tell it when to be done. So if you're having a generated list and you're saying each item starts one period, two period, three period, right? You could say the stop is 11 period and it would generate all the way to 10 and never generate 11. Or if you say a carriage return, then it'll generate a line and then it won't hit carriage return. It'll say, okay, I'm done. It'll stop because it can't hit a carriage return. If you put carriage return, carriage return, then if the pattern you're having it do would result in two carriage returns, it stops. Uh, one note about using carriage return is if you, uh, your prompt does not have a carriage return at the end of it, then it would say, okay, based on the pattern I'm seeing, I should add a carriage return first. Oh, I can't because that's my stop and it won't ever add a carriage return and it won't do anything. Uh, likewise, if you have too many carriage returns, sometimes it'll get confused as well. So you got to pay attention to that white space, trailing white space in your prompts for getting the behavior you're looking for. API methods. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go ahead and show one of the videos and, uh, that I have that shows off some of this. So I'm gonna show you how to work with completions. And I have four videos here um, that we'll go through. And I'll uh, certainly do questions in between them. Show you how to use the REST debugger with the completions API. So I will point out there's a few different API methods here we're looking at completions, but there's also searches, classifications, answers, and files. And also, I am required to pre-record this part and edit it. So if something goes wrong, whether it be uh, sensitive data or whatever, because it is in beta, I have edited that part out. Um, I am going to show that it doesn't always give you exactly what you want. That is where the art of this comes in is the programming the right prompt. So to use a completion, first of all, you need, you have to be logged in, which I'm not logged in right now, and get your API key. Uh, then you do a post method on, so this is the API endpoint, and then we specify the engine we want by engine ID and then completions. And then here's a list of all the parameters you can use which is similar to the parameters you would get if you were in the playground. So let me go ahead and here into the REST debugger. So I, it's a post method. Here's the endpoint, application type JSON. Over here in parameters, um, the resources, engines, DaVinci. Um, generally, everything I've seen says use DaVinci, but you may find optimizations where you want to use the faster ones for some reason or other. And then we're doing completions. Here's where you specify, here's, here's where you specify your token, which I will regenerate this after this session, but you specify, it's a header authorization and you have to put bearer space and do not encode. If you do not do, do not encode, then it converts the space to percent 20 and it's a bearer token. So you have to put bearer space there like that. And that is the syntax to do this correctly. So. My request, I said, my prompt is once upon a time, there lived a small bear named George, max tokens 50, and the result on George's first birthday, a nice bear, a nice big bear gave him porridge pot full of honey, fluff and wisps. So it's creating a little story here. Uh, if I do hit send request again, though, it will generate me a different story with the same prompt. George was quite different from other bears, so it's the same prompt here, so the idea is you'd be salt once. In many ways, for one thing, he was a brown bear, and there were no other brown bears in the forest. Well, now I'm interested. Why are there no other brown bears in the forest? <laughs> Traditionally, bears have been black, but this was mainly because forests naturally contain very many... I don't know. So, uh, if I wanted to get the more story here... Now I'm curious. I want to get more story. So, I would take this result and add it to my prompt here, okay? And now I'll get 50 more tokens after that. Mini black bears, so that all the rest of the colors are pretty much hidden. But brown bears, 
though each of a different shade, did make their appearance now and then. So see, this is interesting because, or a good example, because it has remembered, remembered that uh, we're talking about brown bears and that brown bears are rare. So it's going back to that again. Did it make an appearance now and then? And George's father remembered the name of our bear, George. Harold was a truly deep, rich mahogany. So now we have a mahogany bear. This is interesting. So uh, anyway, this is a uh, interesting completion way you can do this to... Um, I'm actually really kind of curious about the story. Even though I know the story doesn't exist yet, and it is only being generated uh, as I go through here uh, to do this. But, so, but, but, but I wanted to show you the basics of how you use the rest debugger, not dive into a story about a the brown bear named George who had a father named Harold that was a rich mahogany, rich deep mahogany, and lived in a world mostly made up of black bears. So both George and his father are um, odd colors, apparently. Okay, right. so there is uh, introduction to working with completions via the REST API. Uh, now I'm going to show you how to use the API to generate Delphi code. So here's where we may potentially be putting ourselves out of a job. I don't think it's a risk, but I will show you uh, that it does know how to generate Delphi code. So this is another completion. And I wanted to try generating Delphi code here. The prompt is create a Delphi class that descends from T object and contains a method called foo with an integer parameter and a return and a string return. And then I put two character returns in here, which you have to escape out this way. And then I give it the starting writing. I say type t my class equals, and then I see what it generates for me. And we see it came back here. So t my class equals class t object tab private foo integer public constructor create destructor destroy override published property of foo. So that's interesting. Um, oh, I said method. Pop property foo, it's just integer. Read info, which there's the info. So it did declare info correctly. Write info end. Um, I don't see that it added a string return. Um, and I'll create a Delphi limit called limit one. <laughs> That's interesting. Unit one interface uses Windows messages, string uses classes, so on and so forth. Semicolon. So, huh, that's interesting. Now, I will point out I put a temperature of 0.3, which means I reduced randomness, which is the idea that there should be one complete, one correct answer. But if I run this again, I wonder if I'll get the same thing or if I'll get something fairly different. Actually, I have run this a few times and tweaked it each time. So now, okay. So we have a private number called info and a public function foo that takes an integer and returns a string. But we're not using info. Interesting. Huh. It contains my prompt again. I've seen, so I know that there's things I can do to improve this, but I've seen some really good examples that work really well. And a lot of what this does in making these work is a matter of fine tuning it and tweaking it and working with the um, settings and stuff and, and fine tuning your prompt. But I am I like the fact that it generates, it just looks like valid Delphi code here. If I put in a stop of carriage return, carriage return, then it would have stopped right there before uh, putting the prompt back in again. So that would have been the secret to prevent that from happening is putting that prompt in the uh, the stop token. Actually, I guess I could try this in, in Delphi and see what happens, huh? 
So I'll be show you the code running in Delphi or uh, putting the code into Delphi. I'm just starting recording, so you don't have to watch me start up the IDE. And also, I was only recording part of the screen before. So if I go in here and I'll start with type T my class. And then we'll go down here and we'll get all of this and I'll just replace the tabs with or underscore tab or slash tab with tabs. There we go here. And then we'll say probably a shortcut for this. Actually, if I use the decoding, for example, I could do that search. And I'll replace the slash tab with, we'll just replace it with two spaces here. Oh, because I still have regular expressions turned on. So I'm guessing regular expressions is trying to interpret that out. All. Oh, okay. And let's format this. Oh. And so in foo's unsatisfied, but and or foo's unsatisfied and in foo is clear but never used. So it's syntactically correct code. It's curious that it created an info. So when I first few times I did this, it did not create a info private member. But there we go. It can generate Delphi code for you if you explain to it what you want. Uh, again, it doesn't deterministic, so it's not going to generate the same code every time. We could tweak that by changing some of the parameters, some of the settings, but kind of interesting. Okay. Um, the, I, I actually had one time through that it did use a, uh, had a property with getters and setters and constructor and stuff like that. So it does, I uh, didn't, I never have it generate the entire, all the code, but it did, uh, does generate different code. So depending on how you describe it. And so again, the interesting thing is, is that if you're, describing what you want it to do, at what point does the description of it become more verbose than the code itself? Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, one more demo here. So this time I actually build an application that is uh, potentially useful. This is only three more minutes. So glad you're able to stick around for this. I'm to make a simple example application that takes advantage of GPT-3. And that, I was trying to come up with something that was kind of useful <laughs> this is what I came up with. Uh, your definition of whether or not it's useful or not may be different than mine. It's a color picker, but you describe the color. So I got this from one of the examples that come in the playground. And basically what you do is you describe the color and then it will generate the color code for you. And so the default one it gives you is a color like a blue sky at desk. And this is what it gives you. So what I've done here is put down a rest request that has the parameters on it. And then you can specify, you can change the API key. I don't think that persists this yet. So you'd change it at runtime or at design time, or you could change it at runtime, but it will reset each time. Uh, again, I will reset this API key. And then you type in what you want here. And this is kind of uh, crude, but I just included the entire original body here and the replace string that I wanted to use. So I have tweaked this a couple times, tried golden honey, and it replaces that and then updates the authorization and body parameters, makes the request, and then colors a rectangle with the resulting color. Now, sometimes it does a pretty good job. It gives you a useful color. So we can say like golden honey. Yeah, it looks like golden honey. Or we could say um, old chewing gum. I have no idea what color this is going to look like. I suppose gum might look like that. <laughs> Fresh cut grass. Okay, there's fresh cut grass. And then let's see, we'll do... Uh, 
an emerald. Let's try ruby. I probably spelled it wrong. And it was right. Yeah, so there we go. Uh, let's see if I do an old, old pair of shoes. I don't know why that's an old pair of shoes, but okay. Also, it doesn't care if you spell it wrong, so I can put whatever I want to in here. And it will still give me a color. No, it didn't give me color. Okay. That's interesting. But I could say a cat who likes um, fish. And if I change this to whatever, uh, let's see. So, yeah. I don't know why that first one didn't work. There, well, there you go. There's a, a simple color picker for you that uses artificial intelligence to find the color for you. Okay. Uh, so now let me uh, bring up the... At this point, I should have the more information slides uh, where you can go for uh, for more information. I, I, I'm actually going to go ahead and open this YouTube playlist up. I just want to show, talk about each of these videos in here that I put on this playlist. They're, it's I, really good. So this one, Two Minute Papers, if you're into machine learning, uh, you got to follow this YouTube channel. I watch pretty much everything he does. The, the guy knows his stuff. He teaches uh, algorithms and... Uh, does just a fantastic job. That's it, called two minutes papers, but usually not two minutes. It's very rare that I see one of these videos that is two minutes long, but usually they're less than ten minutes. So uh, very, very good. Does a good job explaining it, and uh, very interesting. And there's some some stuff going on that is very, very mind blowingly amazing. So definitely recommend his channel. But his channel here is about this video here is about GPT three. This one is, I highly recommend, this one's uh, 16 minutes long, but this is the one I was talking about where he is talking with a um, machine learning, uh, actually put the uh, link here for this in the chat directly. He's talking with GPT-3 about being a AI and being a, a, um, a being artificial intelligence. And it's really, really interesting, uh, especially, when you think about the fact that it is not programmed to have that conversation, right? It, it, that conversation is coming from its understanding of the corpus of data it was trained on. Um, this is a really cool one here. He shows how to, he, he uses Python and I will, um, I, I actually really like it. I'm probably gonna re-implement this in Delphi because he provides the source code for it too, and I'll show how I did that. But uh, that's an interesting one here. Uh, Cold Fusion is the YouTube channel I, I enjoy that generally has some pretty good content on a variety of technical topics. But here's one on um, uh, GPT-3. Uh, this one is by the same guy here, and he um, this is this one came out before this one, and he just is showing some demos of things that are being done with um, with GPT-3. Okay, so the question here about the links for this, I have, let me put it here in the chat again. You can get the, all the links are available right there and the replays, um, replay will be posted there as well. So this, like I said, this one was early on and he shows some of the examples of things other people have done, which is very interesting. And this is another one here that the guy provides a source code for that is a, uh, it's an AI powered Linux shell, which again, I think I might implement this one in Delphi because it looks pretty useful. It, it is a, it, it's not that complicated when you dive into it and look at it. Basically the idea is that you describe what you want it to do and it will then run that. And so you don't have to know the name of the shell command. So this and the, this example he builds here and this example here are both very, very similar. I'm not sure if one's based on the other, but uh, very cool. And then this video is by the same person here. And this is where he uh, goes in and explains how this one was built. 
but uh, very interesting. Like I said, I, I, uh, if there's interest in this, so if you are interested, I still see it, most of you are still on. If you want to just give a thumbs up, if you would like to see more content on uh, GPT-3 and OpenAI, or uh, I'll raise your hand, I guess, or whatever it is, and I can see how many people have raised their hands and know if this is something we want to do more of. And I can uh, certainly do that. So it looks like a lot of you are, yeah, most of you are raising your hands. Okay, cool. So I will definitely plan on doing more of this in the future. Uh, this is something I am really in excited, interested in. And um, I, so yeah, I will definitely do some on this. And then there was also some comments about being interested in Neuralink as well. Uh, what, so Carlos raised a comment about it being a for-profit. Uh, it says not bad for profit for technology. He does, as most of us do. Uh, the gap will be colossal, so this has to be taken into consideration. You know, it really is. There's a lot of uh, fantastic conversation around ethics and um, and such with uh, AI and machine learning, and it's a real important conversation, and it's moving really fast. I agree. One of OpenAI's missions is to make uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence available to everybody. Um, now, the pricing model they have is reasonable, in my opinion. The, uh, especially for you know people to use it for their own research purposes. You get the uh, they give they give you a three month trial with like eighteen dollar credit, but then the pricing is very reasonable, like I showed you as well for using it on your own. So it's easily justifiable. If you were to if they were to make the entire thing open source and let you download it all and run it locally, the investment required to do that is astronomical <laughs> so it's really not practical the, the size of it too is just it's not something you could download uh, effectively and so it really only works to be as a hosted model because of its scale so the uh, and, and because they're hosting it they kind of have to charge for it unless they're going to monetize it through making us the product, you know, through like advertising or data collection. So I kind of prefer this mechanism to the otherwise, because it is, like I said, it is reasonably priced. Uh, David's asking, is there a list of best use cases for development using GPT-3? Take a look at the examples, David. Um, you can access those without access to the API. I will definitely be doing some more videos on this and more blog posts. So stay tuned for that as well. And I'll explain the things I figured out as I go along. Um, the generally, I guess if I was to provide a few summaries is um, if you're providing examples, provide a couple, like maybe three examples, make sure you're using consistent um, formatting for how the examples work and start with the default settings and then look at, you know, think about is it repeating? If it's repeating itself, then you can turn down the repetition. If it is, um, uh, going on, you know, so you could you can look at the settings, tweak the settings in order to improve the response and the behavior. But if you take a look at the examples, um, that there are a lot of good examples there that kind of give you some ideas. But realistically, I found I look at the examples I'm like, oh, that's so cool. And then I went and tried to use it. I'm like, why doesn't this work? It, it's one of those things that until you start playing with it and uh, tweaking it, that you. I, I'm a big believer in that you don't learn things until you break it. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you fix it, then you're, you're starting to learn. Uh, I tell people when they're wanting to pro learn to program, I'm like, you're going to spend more time reading code than writing code. And as soon as you are, get really frustrated, you know you're on the right track. And at some point, you will look up and realize it's six in the morning and you spent the entire night rewriting your memory manager. And it turns out it was because you had done something else wrong silly someplace else and that that that's that's the side of of you being a successful programmer um uh, let's see a couple questions here is it possible to make it analyze a bunch of numeric data like we can do a simple yes you can um so i didn't get into the um boom, 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 boom. files api reference here but you can use this to upload files, and then you can use the search answers and classifications API to uh, to to look at that. 
uh, so you could do some complex analysis. If you look at the, the examples in here, there is a uh, spreadsheet, partial and structured data, so there's a couple examples. It's not really a numerical system, but it understands, it can understand, uh, it can understand the description of things. So I, I, possibly, I don't know, it, it's a good question. I haven't tried it. Uh, one of the things that still impresses me from the current state of AI is that all algorithms and AI models are open source. That is true. There's a lot of them. So there is a paper. Um, it, so GPT-3 is not completely open source, but there is an academic paper that goes into explaining um, a lot of how it works and the algorithms and stuff like that. So you can, uh, you know, if you are so inclined, gain that higher level or deeper understanding of it. Um, but the other thing to also keep in mind, though, is that there are a lot of other, there are no doubt, so there are a lot of algorithms and things being done that we're not aware of that are not open source. And I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theory person, but it's just the reality is that uh, I know there are things out there that are not being shared. And also one of the things that's really interesting is that even if the uh, algorithm is published and shared publicly, the training data is actually where the uh, a lot of the value is. So that, that makes a big difference. Uh, David says, I wonder if GPT-3 can find all the bugs and security holes in application and source code and fix them? Possibly. Uh, you could certainly, it, it, it's, in, it's theoretical that GPT-3 or a future uh, iteration of it perhaps could have a significant enough understanding of source code to point out, to point out bugs or potential bugs. That's a lot of what static code analysis does. Um, somebody else goes on to say, open source. The key challenging part is computing power. Yes, that's true. OpenAI has tried to address that in a different and more powerful way than the current state of the art. Yes, yes. And so the really interesting thing about AI, though, is that the... So th there was a question last week during our panel about whether one person could revolutionize things. And I think it's possible because if you figure something out, make some sort of interesting enough breakthrough, you can... Act, uh, any individual can get access to computing power through the cloud. And, you know, Amazon has a ton of it. All you need is a credit card and boom, you're off to the races and they're not the only player. So if you were able to come up with something that could legitimately generate you income based off of open source algorithms or, you know, your tweaking of those, you could, you know, very small amount of seed capital, get access to some computing power, start to generate income, you refunnel that income back into buying more computing power on the cloud and uh, quickly uh, escalate, you know, escalate uh, exponentially. Uh, anyway, so, all right, great. I'm so glad that you all enjoyed this and are definitely interested in seeing more of this. I will, it looks like uh, most of you are definitely interested in seeing more on this topic. So I will certainly be sure to do that and uh, look forward to seeing you all online more. I will be posting, I did regenerate my uh, API key actually, right as I hit play on the video, I was like, oh shoot. And I went, and <laughs> I uh, um, rotated my key so that even if you saw the key, it won't work for you. Uh, but I am, I guess I, I mean, I could technically give you my key, but I'd be responsible for how you use it and it would use up all my quota pretty quick, uh, unfortunately. But uh, I will definitely be doing some more. Do go sign up for the waiting list if you haven't yet. Uh, go sign up for the waiting list. I believe they're getting people on quicker now. Like I said, I'm nobody special, but I got access to it and I see a lot of people are getting access to it as well. Um, Callan says AI training is similar to old neural network training. It really is because what really what happened is the deep learning is just taking neural networks and making it massively parallel across the current computing architecture. Looking forward to the next one. Keep up the amazing work. Thanks for the webinar. Very interesting and surprising. Fantastic. Glad you enjoyed it. I, I, I was very excited to see you know, the two things I want to accomplish is I wanted to say, hey, here's how you can use the REST client library to talk to GPT-3 and does GPT-3 under understand object Pascal Delphi code? And it clearly uh, did both of those things. So it, it's exciting, I think. I, I, I'm really excited about this topic, but then it's even more exciting to look at ways that I can uh, connect two things I love artificial intelligence and Delphi together. So thank you, glad you all could join me and I will see you all online 
later. Next step, self-awareness. Carlos, go watch the video where he does the interview with the GPT-3. Uh, it's going to really question your definition of self-awareness. <laughs> this, this one right here. Wow. Oh, it is, is mind-blowing. I'm going to put it in here. Um, all right. Take care, everybody. Talk to you later. Sorry, we went a little bit over. Bye.